I was in a place of spiritual apathy, generally. I mean, I, I was sort of a, an unhappy, a vaguely unhappy but lazy agnostic who thought that eventually, like, surely I wouldn't be an agnostic for my whole life, just didn't seem tenable. Uh, surely, eventually, I would get my act together and I would become Catholic or some variety of Anglican or maybe Orthodox, I mean, go back to my seeker roots. Uh, but I was not doing anything about it. Uh, I, I would ha have and still do uh, describe my sort of epistemology as pragmatist in the William James sense. Um, he's been a hero of mine for, for many years. Uh, this is the uh, early 20th century American philosopher, part of the famous literary James family, um, whose whole, he was one of the pioneers of modern psychology, uh, and a, not a person of traditional faith himself, but very, very open, considered himself very, very open to the whole range of human metaphysical supernatural claims. And his feeling was, we have to constantly be um, aware of the limits of our own access to reality and hold our own truth claims very provisionally and be continually open to revising our theory of the world based on new evidence. And you know, that's a, that sounds lovely. And of course, it's like, it's not how we're wired, you know, by evolution or whatever, right? We're wired uh, with our bias toward confirmation of our existing prejudices and all these things. But in terms of something to aspire to, I really liked William James. Uh, I was continuing to do journalism uh, alongside my ordinary professor work here at the University of North Carolina. So I was working on a magazine article, this is in the spring of 2022, about this local megachurch that uh, I had been aware of for my whole time teaching at UNC because they've got a big presence on our campus among our students. Uh, they're a, a giant growing church. Their pastor had recently stepped down from his term as the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. So I thought, oh, this, this would make, you know, this is a good chance to get to know this church and talk about mega churches and also fold it into a, a broader look at the politics of the Southern Baptist world. Um, so I was doing my usual reporter thing. I had a number of conversations with um, people who attended the church, uh, staff members, uh, was increasingly aware that this church, even by, even by the standards of the Southern Baptist Convention, was really obsessed with evangelism. I mean, Southern Baptists are pretty serious evangelists in general, but this church has sent out more missionaries internationally than any other church in the in the SBC, I mean, every year for the past 10 years or something. And they have planted uh, more than 500 new churches in the United States and abroad. And just every, every person I talked to who was associated with the church was just so single-mindedly focused on evangelism. It made a big impression on me. Um, so that's, those were sort of the, the things on my mind as I went into my, you know, my, my, the, the pivotal conversation, I suppose, which was a conversation I had with the pastor, whose name is J.D. Greer. Yeah, and so not exactly a high liturgical church with bells and smells and incense. <laughs> I'm imagining no. rock band and T-shirts and ripped jeans and that sort of thing. Yes, maybe not ripped jeans, okay. uh, but yes, but yes Baptist, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're 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 the the platonic whatever your cliche is of a suburban megachurch. Mm. That's that's accurate. Although they don't have a coffee shop in the lobby. That's okay. the one piece of the of the parody that that they don't have. I would say. So you left after the first Sunday, and you thought perhaps I have enough to go away and write my article or like, but, but what was it that kept you coming back? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I went to uh, services at the main, it's one of these mega churches where there's like the mothership, you know, the main campus that then broadcasts uh, the, the sermon to all these other campuses. So I, you know, I went to the mothership once I went to one of the satellite campuses. Uh, but the, the key thing that happened was uh, that I, I met the pastor, and um, that interview was when it was it was maybe a little bit longer than normal. Uh, he was a better listener than a lot of these guys are. I mean, I I should say I I have a fair amount of experience interviewing kind of evangelical warlord types. You know, like these guys who uh, very conservative theology, and they've built some sort of empire, um, and they're always like very 
uh, courteous to someone like me, um, but not not that interested in, I suppose, really having a, a two-way conversation, which is fine. I mean, I'm, I'm usually there as a journalist, but uh, there was a little bit more back and forth in this conversation I had with JD, and it, it came out, I mean, I, I don't go out of my way to conceal uh, my own views. I, I never have done that. I mean, it's always been my practice when someone I was interviewing asked me, about my own faith, I would just say, you know, I'm not I'm not a Christian. I, I'm open to it. I'm envious. Sometimes I, I would even say I'm envious of it. Um, but that I found myself volunteering maybe a little bit more about my own views than was typical. And it, he then followed up uh, via email, and we got into this extended email exchange that turned into a venue in which I found myself asking questions focused mainly on the historical claims of the Gospels and the life of Jesus and the resurrection. Questions that, I mean, I hadn't been, it's not like I'd been wrestling with these questions in a self-conscious way. Uh, clearly they were there, like just below the surface. I, I had questions about you know, how, how the, the Christian claims stack up uh, alongside the, the claims that Mormons make about Joseph Smith or Muslims make about the Prophet Muhammad. I mean, all the, all the basic questions, right, that I'm sure he'd heard loads of times. Um, but he he took the questions with sort of shocking seriousness. I mean, he would uh, write me back these really long, um, well-researched, often footnoted answers. Sometimes he would say, you know, I would, I would fire off some half-baked question. I mean, it, I wasn't well-read in this stuff. And he would say, you know, that's a really good question. Let me let me ask some colleagues and, and look at some books and get back to you. So he, he gave me the feeling of taking my questions very seriously. And as this conversation was unfolding, I, I just found myself wanting to continue visiting this this church, even though it was totally it was totally contrary to how I thought of myself. I felt like I was caught in like the tractor beam of the Death Star or something. <laughs> I mean, I'd always, if I'm honest, I mean, even though I I had certainly made fun of megachurch worship in the past, I, at some level, I'd always secretly liked it. I mean, I don't think, it's hard. It's hard to, to go to uh, a mega church worship service when the you know the the band is is rocking out like the room is thumping it's dark and you know that music is like it's it's the same you know syncopation and uh, you know often the arrangements are similar to the music that does well you know in the in the mainstream yep. pop Coldplay, music world right like it's Coldplay and a TED it's, talk, but yeah <laughs> yeah so so. Uh, <laughs> I'm not ashamed any longer. <laughs> I once was. I'm not ashamed to admit that I get affected by it. Um, and the preaching was really good. Uh, was uh, JD and his colleagues, because there's a number of pastors on staff, um, you know, they, they're they not like, it's not like so erudite that it alienates people, but I mean, rarely a sermon would go by. And these are, you know, these are these are reformed Baptist sermons, right? So we're talking like 45 minutes. You know, it's like a it's a great lecture. Uh, rarely a lecture would go by without, you know, quote, quotations of uh, an explication of Greek terms. And I just I felt like I was really learning stuff. It was interesting. And this is this is I'm continuing to go as I'm continuing to kind of have these conversations with this pastor. And at a certain point, I said to him, you know, I'm I'm an academic, I uh, like to learn about things by just reading the, 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 the best stuff on the topic. Can you just give me some homework? And so he recommended that I read some books, uh, we were focused on the resurrection. And the main, I mean, there were there were a number of books uh, that were important, but but the central one that he recommended was uh, N.T. Wright's giant book on the resurrection, the resurrection and the Son of God. Okay, so you like a challenge? So I can tell you, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so I mean, I I just found myself. So this is the summer of 2022. I mean, it was it was it was akin to doing a master's thesis or something. I mean, I just found myself uh, ob obsessively reading about it. Uh, with a, an increasing feeling of excitement, you can check their references, ask around, you can do all your homework. 
But if you want the experience of the relationship, you have to take the plunge. You have to actually enter the relationship and put some trust in, in it, put yourself at risk. And I found that persuasive. And, and so it, it, it made me accept. And I, I also remember a conversation that I had with JD where I was complaining about my lack of spiritual experience. And he said, you know, you just have to take what God gives you. Like God makes people in different ways. Uh, he didn't make you Pentecostal. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. deal with it essentially. And so I realized that, um, if I was willing to suspend my disbelief in the supernatural, which truly it was the, is the hard, that, that was the huge barrier for me. But if I was willing to do that, uh, then I had to grant that while, you know, I didn't find myself 100% persuaded by uh, N.T. Wright's assessment of the evidence or uh, Richard Bauckham or any of these guys that Jesus truly rose from the dead. I, I had to I had to grant that the other the secular alternatives were really not not as persuasive. Uh, and I was certainly north of 51 percent persuaded. And if I was truly a William James style pragmatist willing to adjust my working theory of the universe based on new evidence, then I I had to submit to this. Yes. Yeah, there's that sense of, am I able to take the leap of faith forwards towards Jesus? Well, that's one question. But there's another question, like, can I go back to a materialist view of the world? And with all that I know now, um, I think when God sort of shuts that door behind you, <laughs> there, there's a very significant nudge um, towards, towards taking the leap. 